Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack a Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Here's worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito This is the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, and Brian Murphy. Welcome to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Uh, how about that for a new intro, huh, guys? Oh, I hate my name. Ah, come on. Murph I, Murph, I didn't realize you were a co-host after all these all this time. I didn't either. No, I was promoted without my without my permission, and I don't like it. Oh, I don't need your permission to promote you, Murph. How do you like that? Huh? Uh, yeah. I don't like this. How's, how's that for managing and editing and all that kind of stuff? Anyway, <laughs> uh, Jeff Sharon. Uh, I'm Jeff Sharon this along is like with the Brian. said feud of Mike and the Bad Dog promo. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, Brian Murphy is with us. Hello, Brian. Hi, Jeff. And Eric Green. Lopez is with us here. See, I have to totally redo this here because, like, I have someone else introing us, which is kind of cool. So, hi, Eric. Well, hello, hello, everybody. We've welcome, got. Welcome. We've got a lot to talk about, uh, specifically having to do with um, the Olympic sports. The American has postponed them uh, to the spring, so we, we kind of figure that might happen. But you know, when it does happen, it's like all oh, everything, you know, all hell has to break loose. So we got to think about it. So we will break down what that means for UCF. Um, we'll also t- I've got some UCF football news. We'll talk about scheduling changes, which. I don't think really helped out UCF much, but we'll talk about that. Of course, the AP Top 25 came out. Why should we care? And we got some transfer news also from UCF football. And, if, uh, and of course, we, we will, a little bit later, we will recap Eric Lopez, uh, the final rankings of the uh, top 10 head coaches in UCF yeah, some were, all some time. Some, we'll, we'll break some, it down. Some, some, some you, were getting, you were getting torched on social media, Eric Lopez. You were getting destroyed on social media, whatever Eric that Lopez, means. If Eric Lopez gets eviscerated. By yes. I, I, I turned heel. I turned heel. Watch, how, watch this. How dare you support a coach that won a national right. title? Watch, <laughs> watch UCF fans completely eviscerate this UCF blogger next. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and uh, updates on Dylan Moore and whatnot for baseball. But we begin with uh, the big news of the week from the American all fall Olympic sports have been postponed uh, to the spring. We had an inkling this would happen when the NCAA uh, moved its uh, moved its uh, uh, fall championships to the spring, or at least postponed them with the possibility of them happening in the spring, pending on what happens with COVID nineteen. Uh, the American kind of held out, but then they decided to follow suit. Uh, follow suit. So officially, it's soccer and volleyball. Cross country, we're still waiting on because that's a little bit more complicated. We'll talk about that for a second. But first things first, Eric, you wrote it down. You wrote it for us on the website, um, discussing the uh, what this really means for each of the three UCF teams that compete in the sports: volleyball, men's soccer, women's soccer. And I I guess we'll start. with you first here is well, which of those UCF teams do you think benefited the most from the fall sports being moved to the spring to uh, to line up with the NCAA? I, I would say was volleyball benefited because you have a more structured schedule in the spring. Uh, you have your you have a first of all, and you know the, one of the other storylines is obviously you have an extra year to play with, so you have a chance where these. If it doesn't work out, you still have an extra year with these eligibility. Right. They all get the eligibility back, too. Correct. But I think volleyball benefits because their schedule, Jeff, and I know you were kind of when we first when the schedule came out with the conference philosophy, you were kind of like, 
you know, head scratched a little bit about, you know, some of the issues with the scheduling in volleyball. Now, we don't know if the conference will decide to keep it the way it is, or now that they have more time, do they tweak the schedule? Plus, they, you know, if things do improve, if you're playing in the spring, you know, perhaps UCF can, you know, Todd can help maybe get some of those quality non conference games added. Uh, you know, depending on how we look in the spring. But I, I think volleyball benefited from that standpoint because I think it's got time to kind of tweak a little bit the scheduling. Uh, and not to mention they have a, they're have they going to be playing for an NCAA tournament. And you got to believe they're going to be motivated to go for a three-peat in the American Conference Championship and try to go not only to a third straight NCAA tournament, which would be the first time for the program since 01 to 03. But you know this, Jeff, having covered the team closely. With that nucleus, uh, led by McKenna Melville, but just a great solid group around her. Anne Marie Watson, who's a senior, who may or may you know, get an extra year all of a sudden. It's a group there that it's got a chance to make history. And what I mean by history is no UCF team has ever made a Sweet 16 round in the Division One era. We obviously know about the history with Divi- obviously prior to Division One mm-hmm. with the national title, but you know. A chance to make the Sweet 16, and if I'm, you know, now volleyball, in my opinion, no, I mean, pun intended here, I think we'll have a couple of swings to make that history come now the spring and then later on in the fall of 21. You might be right. I'm really interested to see what uh, what they're going, to, how they're going to format the NCAA tournament now for volleyball. Yep. You know, are they get, is it going to be 64 or 32? I'm thinking it's going to be 32. If it's 32, how are they going to break it down? Is it going to be... All 32 conference winners, because there are there just so happen to be 32 conferences that play Division One women's volleyball, or do they go 16, uh, 16 auto bids and 16 um, and 16 at larges? If they go that route, who gets the which conferences get the 16 auto bids and which ones don't? That's going to be a big source of controversy, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it's I, I do agree with you though. This was a big break for. For UC at volleyball and Todd Dagenet because they're going to get you know this year is going to be Anne Marie Watson senior year, Nerissa Moravic senior year, you, and everyone's going to get an extra year, and it certainly beats the heck out of the alternative, which would have been possibly you know not getting not getting the year at all, right? And then you just lose that year, and obviously you know like we know some players might you know, down the road may forego. I think that also there are some recruiting issues that. Uh, Coach Dajne is going to have to sort it out, as are Coach uh, Sahadak and uh, and Coach Calabrese, um, because they're going to go over the because they're going to be allowed to go over the limit um, for at least one year. We'll see how they work it out down the line, or if they have to work it out down the line. And then the um, and the other thing that I think is really um, is, is going to be uh, really that they're going to have to do is they're really these sports are really going to have to buckle down on fundraising. In order to in order to cover those extra scholarships too, and um, I think that's the unsung part of this. And we've seen you know UCF try to get some fundraising drives um, going here during COVID nineteen, but that really has to be key, I think, for the fans. And it's going to be a tough time because um, you know obviously not, not everyone has a lot of disposable income right now. Um, were there any were there any teams that you thought Eric? Maybe didn't maybe didn't quite benefit quite as much. Yes, I think it's men's soccer, uh, big time. I think there's some serious questions about this roster moving forward, and the reason is soccer, uh, and you know, unlike volleyball, soccer, a lot of times players uh, have pro opportunities. So a lot of times, for example, you know, the MLS stra- super draft, not draft, super draft is usually held in January. And you look at the UCF men's soccer team for Coach Calabrese, Yoni Sorokin and Luis Perez jumps out as seniors who are, you know, probably their two best players alongside the goalie, Yannick Erdo, is a two-time goalkeeper of the year. These are guys that all have pro, you know, probably have pro opportunities waiting for them, whether it be in the MLS or overseas in Europe. So what I'm curious about is, does Calabrese and UCF, do these guys, will they be around in the spring? Or if one of them is, let's say, is drafted in the MLS, do they decide to go pro? So this roster could look different in the spring than, say, uh, in the fall right now. And that's big because I think this team was a team that was going to be the favorites in the American. Uh, they have a ton of seniors 
Hatibu Barry is another senior on this team who's a guy that I think they were going to uh, depend on to help make up for some of the scoring they lost in the great Cal Jennings, who's obviously now playing in the USL. I think they've got some issues. And I know some, and I can tell you this, Jeff and Murph, uh, in talking to people over this last handful of days, uh, soccer, there were a lot of soccer people that were pushing to play in the fall. And you know this, Jeff, you, you and I spoke to Coach Calabrese, I want to say it was last fall, as a matter of fact. And what was the big topic that was going on in men's soccer that he was talking about? Oh, the, well, the big thing that they've been trying, that he and I think a few other coaches around the country have really been trying to push for was making soccer a two-semester sport, just like yeah. tennis and golf. Correct, to help development of players and things like that. And, and, also, I, for, and also for health, too, right? Because they're playing two yes. games a week, and yes. then they could go to playing yes. one game a week, too. 100% correct. And so I think a lot of soccer programs, and you've seen this, the Southeastern Conference announced on Thursday, they're moving forward with the Olympic sports this fall. The Big 12 announced their soccer schedule on Monday. I don't think it's an accident. I think soccer in those big conferences, are. there's a couple of narratives there. I think there's a narrative of those conferences wanting to, from an optic standpoint, trying to play football in the fall. They want to say, hey, we're playing these sports as well, not just football. But I think the other optics is I think soccer programs and a lot of the bigger programs want to experiment here playing two semesters because that's what the SEC is going to do. And it looks like the Big 12 is going to try to do that too where they get some matches in. I'm very fascinated to see how that's all going to work, if it works, and what the NCAA has to say about that because I have many questions about that. Like how is that going to work if one team is playing in the fall and the others are playing in the spring. We don't have clear answers on that. But I think men's soccer is the biggest loss. Bigger than women's soccer, only because women's soccer didn't have as many marquee players potentially they could lose right now like men's soccer does. So I think men's soccer is the big loser, potentially, potentially. We don't know for a fact. Hopefully the Manuclius can return in the spring. But there, that is going to be something to look uh, and, and keep an eye on here over the next few months is the rosters of the soccer programs. Brian, Slight segue to football here. Does d- does this decision, in your opinion, does does it factor into potentially what may end up happening with football at all, or no? No, but uh, no. Uh, and I just wanted to, like say that my overriding thought when this came down, even though it was so inevitable, it, it it's just it's just sad. It, it's it's because uh, you know these coaches know that some of these players will not be able to partake in the spring semester uh, sports. They will, you know, they, they might graduate this fall and they won't be able to take advantage of this. This was their last opportunity. They have already played their last game and didn't, did not know it. And I feel for those athletes who, uh, you know, will not get that chance again. And, and it, to me, that's my overriding emotion through all of this. I'm happy that UCF, you know, and, and these other teams do now get a chance to vie for conference and national titles within the same season. But uh, for some of these players, they're not going to play again, and that's just too bad. Um, but for football, no, this is inconsequential to them, no matter what you want to say about possible optics. Now, to, to clarify, I just want to make it clear, too, that we, if that's the case with any soccer or, or volleyball players, we have no idea who that might right. be. But we I don't know Jeffrey, yet. But yet we don't. But I'm sure some of these coaches do. Oh, right, right. I mean, it, 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 or at least they may. In most cases, they might. I mean, there might be some surprises along the way. We just don't know. But I think that one of the, you know, especially the ones who are graduating in the in the fall or are scheduled to graduate in the fall and have no intention of going to graduate school or are planning on going to graduate school somewhere else. Right. That's right. the other thing. Well, I think it's also it's worth pointing out we're focusing on seniors, but you know this, Jeff. Soccer is similar to football in that you don't have to be a senior to to play professionally. Yeah, true. Like Coach Sahate, women's soccer has been hurt. As, well, I I don't want to say hurt because that makes it sound selfish, right? I mean, I, I, Coach Sahate has been very supportive of their players pursuing a professional career as they should be, uh, but. She has one of the things that's kind of I, I don't know what the appropriate word would be was they have lost some talented players. No, I, I, I think I think it was Dina fair Orshman. to say that, that that when Stephanie Sanders and Dina Orshman left, that did that you know that did hurt UCF. Obviously, it certainly helped the two of them. No question about it. And right. and, and, I, we, and I, we don't I, and I don't right. and none of us should begrudge them for that at all. I don't think. But 
you know, I mean, those, those are two players I think that UCF was counting on that they didn't have. And especially at UCF Women's Soccer, as we had Michelle Akers on here uh, recently on the podcast, there's a history of UCF players playing internationally and professionally uh, that's very rich. So I kind of feel like there's a there's a it's almost like a, a a tradition there that you know it's so. But nonetheless, it does hurt soccer because you know that you lose a couple players like that. You know now the good news for Coach Sahadek and I wrote about this as we broke down each sport. She's got a top 25 recruiting class coming in was coming in for this team. So whenever they play, if they play in the spring, they're going to be talented there, and I think deep enough. So I don't think they'll be as hurt as much as my concerns are with men's soccer as far as the potential because men's soccer's got a lot of players that have been part of those two championships and, of course, that Sweet 16 round last year. I think they, were, they, would, be, they would be the favorites of the American Conference if this group could stay intact in the spring. Right. Yeah, so, again, we're going to have to follow this closely, and uh, and, and we'll see. But I think that – in general, I think the coaches right now are kind of breathing a sigh of relief that, you know, okay, well, we have the chance to play for a conference title, have the chance better to play than, for a right, better than national title. Be- okay. Certainly, it, um, in, in, a, in a universe of, you know, n- less than optimal options, like this is actually, I think for UCF, the, the best possible option that they could have. So, um, and so we'll have to wait and see what happens. We'll also have to wait and see what happens with cross country too, because, um, you know, we we were talking about that. That's it, a tricky book. Yeah, tricky that is, that is a tricky one for a couple reasons. And I think the the first one has to do with you know they don't want it to interfere with the outdoor track and field season. Is that right, Eric? Well, correct. The problem that cross country, and I think that's why they didn't push it, is you, it's not as simple as moving to the American uh, to the spring because that's when the outdoor track and field season is going on. Right. And from and, a, and all those the, and all the tr- cross country people, they're distance runners in the spring in the track and field. Yes. Bingo. And what you can't force – oh, and you're like, well, why can't they just do both? No, you can't because now you're running risk of injury uh, and, and really a lot of different things. So I think they're still trying to figure this out. I've been told from people that around the cross country, I mean, they were been pushing for the fall because their argument, guys, is that they're the safest sport of them all. There's no contact. You're just running. Uh oh. And you, you can, and you can. Well, I, I, I'm just, I'm not saying I, I'm not, I'm just speaking. As I, I, we're we're going to get some I, angry email from some cross country people <laughs> for saying that. <laughs> well, they think, they think they can socially distance. They could do the protocols. They think they could put it. What I think is try, what's going on is I think they're, I'm wondering if they think they could try to sneak it in, in the winter, but I think they're trying to see what their options are. I just don't see a scenario where they could fit it in, in the spring. Also, uh, I, I've heard this on the on the high school level as far as track and field goes, but could you see when they have meets like for for um, for like for like those like for like the meter running for like running events, could they possibly have more heats in order to have fewer runners competing in each race in order to separate yes. the lane? Yes, because that's think- happening on the high school level. Correct. Yes, I think that's why. Yes, I could see definitely some of that. Uh, as well but yeah this is a, a complicated thing because you have the cost country season with the indoor track and then you have the outdoor track season in the spring it's not that simple to fit it in and um, so it, it remains to be seen if cross country can be it could be pulled off or not and if so how do they do it in a positive light from the from a UCF standpoint they only have a couple seniors on this roster uh, so they're in pretty good shape they're very young and developing and historically, UCF is stronger on the outdoors season anyway. And I would argue, based on their roster as of now, that is still the case. But so it's not all. I mean, what, I'm, and obviously, it's. I would hopefully they could still figure it out. But if you, you know, of all the sports options, if if you have to lose one for UCF, that's probably the one that they could be okay with. You know what I mean? They could because even the players they don't even the, the race the they can't participate in the cross country season. They're still gonna participate in the tr- outdoor track season more than likely. So yeah. uh that's that's the thing. But it's gonna be interesting to see how they figure all that out because it is very complicated and I know there's been a lot of talk behind the scenes. And I think Brian you just mentioned a great point. That's one of the ideas that's been thrown out there and why they're pushing to see if they could have still do this in the fall. Or in even maybe a winter, some sort, as they can. And that's going to be fascinating how all these sports will get scheduled around the spring sports and then the winter sports because there's even, I mean, it, you know, John Rostein reported on Thursday that it looks like the college basketball season now is going to get pushed back to around Thanksgiving or maybe even that first week or so of December. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're right. So, I mean, we're all, again, it's another one of these things. We're all kind of remember those. Remember, we used to say equinox every time in those springs. One. Oh, the whole season's going to be a sports equinox. <laughs> the whole, the, it's the whole thing is going to happen. So, uh, so again, we'll have to monitor what happens with cross country. I think they'll try and fit it. I, I, if if I were the NCAA, I would try and fit it in into the winter because remember, it comes down to the team qualifications and how many meets you get to do. You could probably pull off, you know, in the month of December, I think three different, you know, three, four different meets. Um, and you'll probably have to change some of the, the qualifications. Only, the only, but I guess the only question I would have, uh, and I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert in this, does the weather play a role in that? Oh, like, certainly. Right? Like, is that a concern that, hey, it's too cold, you know, because usually around winter they're doing indoor stuff uh, early on in the indoor yeah, season. because it, indoor like track is a winter sport. So, right. So I'm wondering if that's an issue, possibly, if they could pull it off in cross country or not. Or if they do, they may have to literally find a warm climate like, I don't know, Florida here is pretty good in the winter. <laughs> it's true. It's true. All right. Um, when we get back, we're going to talk uh, We're going to talk about football. And first of all, a schedule change for UCF. And then, of course, the rankings are out from the AP. Should that matter? And then uh, some transfer news also we'll talk about a little bit in depth with Murph. And uh, Eric, plenty more uh, after this break. Stick around. I'll be right back. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical. Welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff, Eric, and Brian here with you. Let's talk UCF football. Uh, don't forget to uh, follow us at uh, UCF underscore Banneret on Twitter, Facebook.com slash Black and Gold Banneret, and of course, Black and Gold Banneret.com. We are your home for UCF Sports on SB Nation, where you can find news on UCF football. We are maybe a few weeks or maybe a um, a little bit more than a month from football. I don't know. Maybe Murph. I don't know. We got games. We got we got games scheduled for next weekend with other that, teams playing. Memphis has got the, they're playing next Saturday. Well, oh, you yeah, you sound all excited about it. There you were on Twitter saying I'm not watching. Well, I won't. But I'm just saying there's game <laughs> schedule. I'm not saying I'm going to watch. I'm just saying there are games scheduled. Whether it stays scheduled, who knows? But we'll see. I mean, yeah. as of this as of this recording, <laughs> that's probably as, yeah. That's, on that's Thursday, fair. We're, we're 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 about 24 days away from UCF football season, so we're hey, it's a day by day process. But it, but it, if you as you found out, like if you were following online with like what's happening with ECU today, uh, things can change quickly. Yeah, in a New York minute, as as Don Henley said. But um, the new the first the most recent news from today is that two of UCF's games got moved from weekdays to Saturday. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the road games at ECU. And Memphis. So ECU was scheduled to be the, basically the conference opener, which it, it was scheduled for Thursday, September 24th. It will now be Saturday, September 26th in Greenville. And then the next road game for UCF was the Memphis game at the Liberty Bowl. That was going to be a Friday night game on October 20, October 16th, rather. And uh, that is being moved back to Saturday, October 17th. Uh, initial impressions is that this move kind of stinks for UCF. I'm not going to lie because there's no, there's because you're not going to get the national TV audience that you would have on a weekday, right? It's going to get shuffled down to, you know, possibly ESPN two or ESPN U. Now, granted, I'm sure that Josh Heupel, if he were sitting here with us, would be like, fine by us. We get the extra days off. Right. But well, let's, I mean, the first one, the East Carolina game, we were just talking about how, wow, they're going to be at a disadvantage in a short week, though. So you can't have it both ways. That's fair. You know? That's fair. You know, that's the – now, I would argue, I think part of this, especially the ECU game, I, I and, and I don't know, and I'll let Murph explain, because there was a lot of changes in the conference schedule in general, which I'm kind of confused about. But I think the ECU game has a lot to do with the NBA playoffs, which is still going to be going on at that point in the bubble – which ESPN owns. So I, I have a feeling that had an influence on that. Not to mention, let's be honest, 
Uh, you're lacking a lot of Saturday games with no Big Ten football, no Pac-12 football, so you got to fill those slots too if you're TV networks at ESPN, so you're probably trying to fill some slots out. And I actually think that Memphis game will still get a good TV slot, but we'll see. Uh, Brian, yeah. what, what was your what was your take on this? My immediate reaction was this is really good. Uh, I mean, it, it good relatively because, you like Eric said, that, that sort of opening two weeks of – going to Georgia Tech, playing on the 19th of, of September, then having to come home and fly up to East Carolina for a game on the 24th, five days later between two different road trips, uh, that, I mean, that you know that, that was a disadvantage, let's be honest. So at least now, at the very least, UCF will have a full, uh, normal, and a very abnormal year, but a normal practice week leading into their first two games. That is significant. And also of less importance, but still worth mentioning, I guess, is that right now UCF does not have a game scheduled for October 10th. That might change. I don't know. We've heard. Uh Uh-oh, Murph bomb. Murph bomb coming. Stop, stop. Don't don't even go. (laughs) Not tonight, guys. Not tonight. Uh, We certainly, Josh Heupel (laughs) thinks that this team is going, you know, that UCF is going to add a game at some point. It could be in that October buy area of October 10th, but that you know if it stays open and having the Memphis game being moved back a day, then that means UCF gets a full two weeks between their games on the third, the game against Tulsa, which is right now the home the home opener, and the game at Memphis on the 17th. So, uh, you know, in some small way, I think this does not hurt UCF. Certainly, the East Carolina movement helps UCF. Uh, I, I would say fairly significantly. Um, as far as why this is happening now, it's it's sort of it's sort of above me. I'm not exactly sure. This is a part of six different. This was this was two games out of six that the American Conference decided to move around today. Now they they moved some games back like they did with UCF. They also moved some games forward a day or two. Yeah, they um, they moved like the, Houston at Memphis. They moved up to a Friday, and right. that game's that game's going to be worth watching if you ask me. I mean that's. <laughs> Right, so that that becomes that becomes uh, that be, you know that, that moved up one day, um, but it all, these 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 are you know in the end these games all stay on their same week. Uh, it's just some finagling with the schedule, but for UCF, I think getting two extra days between road games is not something uh, to just take for well, granted. Well, Brian, I think your point, I mean, about that October tenth is very really fascinating. Who knows? It, it, that would you do you think UCF maybe put this request in there because that's uh, that's kind of sounds like what you maybe are alluding to that maybe this uh, you got to believe UCF maybe put the request in to move the ECU game obviously because they're playing Georgia Tech on that Saturday on the road prior so that makes sense could this be both requests that UCF made that the the league said yeah we'll help you out yeah but if that's the case then wouldn't East Carolina and Memphis have to like mutually agree to that. Certainly, East Carolina, since they're the they're the home team for that game. I don't I don't imagine. I, again, I'm not sure if East Carolina schedule off the top of my head, but like I can't imagine them saying, "Yeah, we're fine with giving our opponent two extra days to prepare." Well, East Carolina's <laughs> got some bigger issues right now they're dealing that's with. True. So. That's but, uh, true. <laughs> we are we are sort of like we're we're just sort of grasping at straws as to why this is happening. Um, um, but I think the the bottom line here is that UCF. The, that that first that second road game the the time between those first two road games is now going to have the full week you know between them and that is um you know that's not nothing yeah well what's interesting I'm studying this this changes right now they moved the SMU to lane game to that Friday night slot that was was originally going to be UCF Memphis so they kind of did a little switcheroo uh. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. fascinating to me. That I, look, I think we also would agree on this. Whether we think the schools requested it or didn't agree or did not, I definitely think television has a role in this. Do we agree with that? Because this is all ESPN scheduling here as well. well Friday night games and Saturday. And I'm wondering again if UCF and Memphis are off to great starts. Don't be shocked if maybe that's a Saturday primetime game. Well, here's the here's the other thing that's pretty interesting. This is the first time in. Gosh knows that I can remember that uh, UCF did not have a weekday game. Well, they do have one weekday game officially right now, of course, Black Friday at South Florida. But um, right now, every game is scheduled for a Saturday. I can't remember the last time that that's happened. 
So I think I'm, if you're, jo- I think I, I, if you're Josh Heupel, you like that. You oh like yeah, that, if you're right? if you're Josh Heupel, you like that. If you're a fan, you like that. Of course, if you're going to be able to even go to the game, we don't even know if that's the uh, case right now. That's a whole other discussion. But, um, but I, I, I'm I'm dubious of how much, um, of how much of an impact television may have had on it because if you're ESPN and UCF is the top brand in the American, wouldn't you want them on weekday games? Yeah, but if you need slots on a Saturday night on ESPN or ABC, wouldn't that be an option too? How many of those slots do you have? That's the question. I think that's what they're trying to figure out, right? I mean, yeah. that's the thing. Keep in mind, we're well, this is on. We just had an ACC game moved a couple weeks. Unfortunately, this is not going to be the last time on this podcast. Regardless how you you know whether the season goes through or doesn't, I don't believe this will be the last time we're going to be talking about scheduling changes. The you know leading up to games a week or two later, I, I think. Uh, this season, we're going to see some tweaks back and forth there with the scheduling for various reasons. Yeah. Well, various reasons, yes, but really it comes down to basically one reason at the moment. Um, but we'll keep an eye on that. But the other news that came down um, that I think we're going to – well, we talked about the, uh, the, the coaches poll last week. Well, the AP poll came out uh, earlier this week as well. UCF can't, comes in at number 21. One spot, interestingly enough, behind Cincinnati, who is 20th. Um, Knights, of course, finished uh, 24th in the AP poll last year after a 10-3 and season. But um, here's the part that I find interesting. Did you see the tweet that UCF came out with a few minutes after that, right? Where <laughs> they said, really, we're ranked, um, what was it, 14th? Because if you take out the Big Ten... And pack twelve teams that are ahead of them, and the eight, and and if I'm not mistaken, the AP has said that you know when we actually start playing ball, the uh, the those teams from the uh, Pac-12 and the Big Ten they're not going to be ranked. Right. Uh, so so that means that UCF is going to jump in the polls probably <laughs> in the first few weeks. Um, they they could be in the top ten if they were to blow out Georgia Tech. That's not that crazy. No. Oh. It, uh, well, again, is it though? I mean, it, I mean, in for, this year, nothing is nothing. Nothing with nothing is 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 out of the question. Well, well, here's <laughs> well, I, I think here's here's the, here's the general gist of it, right? This is as good a head start as UCF football has had to a season ever, ever, right? I mean, if the if the rest of these teams basically if they moved everybody down or they move everybody up who's playing and they move everyone out who's not playing, you're knocking on the door of the top ten at the start of the year. You know what, fourteenth, and like you said, Eric, yeah, yeah if, if they if, if they go to Atlanta and play very well against Georgia Tech, I mean Georgia Tech's not very good coming into no. this season, um, but you know no. UCF going to Atlanta, Bobby Dodd Stadium, beating up an ACC team if that happens. Uh, that that is going to turn some heads. Yeah, I could see UCF kind of climb. Do you think that they'll climb any higher than like 10, 9, 8, even if they go undefeated? That's the question. Murph, you want to take that one first? Yeah. No, because <laughs> we're going to get to the point of does this even matter? And my argument is absolutely not. Okay, go. why not? Why not? Because remember last week, and Eric brought up, I thought at the, at the time was a fine point about, look, we may not have a CFP because – this, so these these rankings, the coaches poll and the AP might really decide a champion because we may not have a CFP poll. Well, guess what? The CFP is on, baby, and they're going to start on November seven, November seventeenth, starting their first rankings on November seventeenth, and they will have rankings every week uh, up through December fifteenth. Have selection day on, uh, I believe, on December twentieth. So the CFP is still going to decide. Who is a champion or who is ranked, you know, wherever. These other polls are just debate fodder and it's worthless. But except the AP poll could still vote for their own champion. Well, here, well, here's the other question that, uh, okay, that, that opens up a whole other can of worms. But here's the other, I mean, we know that the CFP guys, at least they take their cues from the coaches in the AP, don't they? But the, that, but the, but the CFP is recognized as the poll of uh, the poll, poll of record, record basic yeah right yes yeah no we right have, we have talked for about for a couple of years now about how too much is made 
of the coaches poll and the AP poll as long as the CF poll is if people is around and it's and as long as the CFP poll is going to continue forward and right now it is then that still holds true i do I, not care about these rankings if and, the cfp exists. and in a normal year brian murphy is a thousand percent correct dead on set correct but this ain't it's no normal, normal year, year. <laughs> it's 2020 which means anything is possible and i do think and the, uh, now, a key factor is going to be the American. And you mentioned, Jeff, Cincinnati being ranked ahead. I actually think that's a good thing. I, If I'm UCF, I want as many American conference teams ranked. Yeah, the and pressure's on about, them. And by the way, and, and I'm going to – Brian made this point. I forget which episode it was. But I want to bring this up because remember in 2018, it was probably right around this time, how UCF fans were mad at the polls. They thought there was a conspiracy – because UCF was ranked so low because they didn't have Scott Frost. Remember that whole argument? How can they be? How can they bring everybody? Well, they did the same thing this year. The league, the, the posters did with Memphis, right, Brian? Because yeah. you still, yeah, like that's Memphis. true. They still return yeah. a good nucleus. It's the same storyline. The reason they're not being ranked is because they don't have Mike Norville, and so they're they're not even ranked. <laughs> they're receiving oh. votes. I would, I would have thought they would have moved up not having Mike Norville, but you know, I thought I, I've seen people who, who you know prominent college football voices who. May, may, I don't think they have a vote in this poll, but they put out their own, like, if I was voting in the AP, here's what I would say. And some people had Memphis uh, ranked, you know, right below or right with UCF above Cincinnati. Right. Um, I mean, Memphis has a, an All-American. I mean, the, the only All-American in the American Conference comes from Memphis. It's the running back, Kenneth Gainwell. Uh, and, and, they, and they have a quarterback in Brady White, who, if he takes advantage of an extra year of eligibility – would I think be like a ten-year college player? Uh, it's it's fascinating. <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, Memphis is the last team out, or the first team out with eighty-six votes. Right, Tennessee's but, number twenty. They would be twenty-sixth. But if you're yeah. Memphis, you're a fan. You're th- you're thinking the same thing you see. We thought back in twenty eighteen. Why are we not being ranked? We have a nucleus that won the championship last year. The only reason we're being punished is because we lost our head coach. I think That's what it. I think what really burns them is the fact that it's Tennessee that took the last spot ahead of them. Oh, <laughs> right, just like what At happened it, in eight and five Florida Tennessee. <laughs> well, is it? It's deja vu because wasn't that part of the arg- the anger? Wasn't Miami or Florida State one of them ranked ahead of UCF in the yeah. preseason in eighteen? Here, here's let me let me throw another one. And, and like I said about the poll thing, if UCF were to blow out Georgia Tech, I agree Georgia Tech's not good, but there is going to be very little non-conference games this year. And, and with the Big Ten and the Pac-12 out of the equation, you got to talk about something other than the SEC and Clemson. Because with all due respect to the rest of the ACC, uh, although I think Miami might be pretty good with King at quarterback, but the rest of you are irrelevant. So well, North, Car- 12, North Carolina is too bad UCF yeah. lost that game because they're coming in at 18th. Yeah, we'll see how long that lasts. But uh, there's not a lot of teams there. So if UCF – can blow out Georgia Tech because I I think that game will get a pretty good time slot, assuming we stay on schedule here on the 19th. Because remember, the SEC does not play that day. Um, I know there are some ACC games, but overall, it's a pretty light schedule. So I wouldn't be surprised if they got a decent slot. And if they blow them out and they can get into the top 10 all year, I'm gonna there's going to be that push about, hey, in a year like this, why not give them a shot in the playoff? They've proven it over three to four years now. I think that narrative pushes. And if you can get a team like Cincinnati and Memphis, uh, Brian, I don't know, if maybe an SMU, other teams in the league to step up and have a similar year to last year, then UCF might actually have a better opportunity to have a resume in getting wins over ranked teams and slip into the playoff. And if you're yeah. in that 6-7 range, it's a lot harder for the playoff t- uh, to uh, committee to ignore. Murph, are we actually hearing Eric Lopez being bullish on UCF to the playoff in 2020? Well, are we really I, hearing that with our ears? I mean, and that's fine. I, I, mean, I told look, you, it's, it's not a normal year. <laughs> it's August. We can do whatever we want. Fair. Uh, uh, but I will say, for those who, who are unaware of just how bad Georgia Tech is, uh, they're this bad. There are odds out for over under team win totals for every conference that's still playing. And the ACC, you know, you have Clemson's over under ten and a half wins. Florida State's at seven. Miami's at seven and a half. Georgia Tech's over under is two and a half. Two and a half wins. Oh lord! 
for under for Twitch deck. This, this is the kind of rat poison I get scared of, though. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I, uh, by the way, I'll give you another point about why I do think the rankings matter in this year in particular. If they are in the top ten, even if you don't believe they make the playoff, that's still having that number digit will help you get good TV slots. Go True. back to full circle. So that does help from a TV standpoint. So there's nothing wrong with that. And not to be, you know, you're saying I'm bullish. Murph, I did look it up. The conference, the semifinals, Rose Bowl, and the Sugar Bowl. So I'm just mm. saying, make some. You could go back home to State California to cover if UCF's in the Rose Bowl. Maybe. Oh boy! I, could you imagine? Yeah. Or Bourbon I, Street. I, I have I have plenty of places to stay in Pasadena. I know that. I by the way, go, speaking of TV, Eric, because you mentioned this back a few minutes ago about that UCF Memphis game on October 17th, and possibly that could be a, a you know a Saturday night game that weekend. Uh, just looking at the schedule. There is LSU, Florida, and Georgia, Georgia, Alabama. Uh, so, well, like, well, that, I don't know. Well, if that's, that so that's going to be fascinating because CBS would have the first pick. Right. The, the CBS decide to do a doubleheader and grab both of them. We don't know the answer to that, obviously. We may hopefully know that, by the way, but in the next week or so. But that's a great point. If they don't. If they don't, CBS is going to pick one of those games. In fact, I would I would bet they will pick the Alabama Georgia game, and I wouldn't be shocked if that's a CBS primetime game. Let's say they don't do a doubleheader. ESPN cannot they cannot air the LSU Florida game on ABC. It has to be on ESPN. That's a TV at least for the next couple of years. Once they get the full rights, that's gone. So my the reason I bring all that up is ABC still has a slot to fill in primetime. Now I don't know what the ACC. I, so, options are that again well I'll well, I, I, well the, it, it, whatever the acc has you that has or the big 12 or the, or big, the big 12, 12 I, right I keep, for, I keep forgetting the big 12 for some reason i know they're still playing but the acc <laughs> options would be like notre dame louisville or uh my i mean miami pittsburgh jesus no uh, <laughs> uh it's it's not who's syracuse it's, playing <laughs> baylor oklahoma state whoever syracuse is playing Clemson's playing Georgia Tech, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, Florida, Florida State, North Carolina, like that's there's not it. a whole lot of competition. Right, that's my, and I think that's why we're seeing this Memphis UCF game getting yeah. moved there because you just went through that schedule, Murph. It's a lot to be desired overall. It's not very deep, and I, mm-hmm. I think that Memphis game, if it's not an ABC primetime game, I could see it being a three thirty game, just like it was in 2018. Remember where you were there. For the uh, for that classic in eighteen in Memphis, and, I think that that's what they're staring at. And the thing and the thing that we forget, it's so easy to forget right now. But how about but <laughs> you know, let's let's just remember that with the Pac twelve and the Big Ten not in the equation right now, that mm-hmm. the American. It, you're right, Eric. The American is going to get much better time slots on Saturdays. Especially in that noon slot where you where yep. you usually see yep. the Big Ten, yep. um, and three thirty, three thirty, and, th- and yeah, like slots. you said, three thirty. The Big Ten doesn't really doesn't really play very many primetime games at all. If they do, they put them on Fox usually. But, um, but you know, uh, again, that's going to be it. That's gosh, what a huge win for the American boy! Isn't everyone glad that the that the American signed that big media deal with ESPN now? Aren't they? Huh? Huh? Anybody? Right. <laughs> I'm waiting for Eric to chime in. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's pretty good. No, you're right. They are a big winner. Because remember, there are people like, oh, man, how many games are going to be on ESPN Plus? Not as many as we maybe we would have thought. Exactly. If we get this through. Exactly. All right. As far as within UCF's, uh, within UCF's locker room, a um, little bit of uh, transactional news, Brian Murphy. Tony Gray, the uh, offensive lineman who transferred initially to UCF from Ole Miss, has announced that he will enter the transfer portal and leave UCF. So, a couple quick questions for you on that. Um, what, where does that put the offensive line right now? Because he was expected to contribute this year, wasn't he? Certainly. I mean, there UCF is pretty much wide open uh, at both tackle spots right now. I mean, really, if you listen to Josh Heupel, uh, he'll say they're open uh, across the line. But I think their, their biggest question marks are on the edges. At tackle, and and we heard in the spring from offensive line coach Clint Ellerby that that Tony Gray was in was in sort of a three man race competition with Edward Collins and Sam Jackson uh, at left tackle. I guess it didn't uh, and, really you know, work out all that well, did it? Well, there's been change. Yeah, I guess not. 
there's been changes, I think, up and down. Uh, you know, there's been changes since the spring in in all, you know, as far as what each of these camp competitions looks like at all positions. Um, but for Gray, maybe he saw that, you know, he was not going to win that battle and decided to take his – take. oh, God, I want to say take his talents. I hate that phrase, but um, just to try something to go somewhere else. Um, so that really leaves UCF with, you know – only three known options. Certainly, they will develop depth, and depth, and guys will come up, you know, and come up and, and play uh, throughout the year. Certainly, this year among all all other years, because with another year of eligibility guaranteed, you really don't have to worry about that red shirt rule of playing guys only four games. You can play them in how many ever games? Because you're going to get an extra year. So you're going to see a lot of guys play. But for UCF at tackle, it's basically three guys that we know are going to get. Uh, extensive playing time. And that is going to be uh, Marcus Tatum, the transfer from Tennessee, uh, who's a grad transfer, jo- J- Josh McMullen, and Edward Collins. Now, Heupel talked up each each of those three men today when we talked to him on a press conference, said all of them are having good camps so far. Uh, it, it talked about how, how Tatum has gotten stronger uh, since since the winter and has really picked up uh, his – his play since camp opened. I will also mention that Sam Jackson has played tackle. Really, Sam Jackson, I think, is the most is the most integral part of this line because he can feasibly play anywhere on the line. He has played all five positions and regularly played three positions per game last season. So UCF still has the options at tackle even without Tony Gray. I guess my, my one concern is, and this is going to be the case with everybody this year, is depth. Right. Because God forbid something happens and however many guys get wiped off the roster for a couple of weeks due to yeah. exposure to COVID-19. Right. I think that's the one thing that kind of seeps into my head. What if it happens on the offensive line? Then what? We're going to have guys who haven't been played before come in and get snaps. And that's the whole and. But everybody knows this, and they know that this is going to be a year where your depth is going to be tested. And I, I feel like what the like at least at least at the at, sort of at the at the iceberg level, sort of what we can see. I, I think UCF is is okay right now with its options, and and because it, it has some versatility. They certainly like I talked about Sam Jackson, but Cole Schneider can also play different different positions as well. Um, they have a, a, a number of guys who can play guard. So they can mix and match there, and then if 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 the situation gets worse to where there's a you know an outbreak and and you know multiple offensive linemen are down, you're gonna have to see guys who are who otherwise be buried on the roster get playing time. And as I said, in this year where everyone gets an extra year, you don't have to worry about limiting guys to four games in order to keep their red shirt. Um, but guys are gonna have to be ready, even with the new transfers that UCF has brought in, the four new transfers that they brought into the Power Five. Those guys just got here a couple of weeks ago. They're going to really have to speed up their learning curve because those guys are going to have to be ready. And, and they may not be looked upon as immediate contributors, but you don't know. Something could go wrong where an entire position gets wiped out and you need to call upon these guys and they need to be ready to play and carry out the defense or the offense and do what's expected. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, again, that's going to be a – Something that you know, something that I think the coaching staff and the fans certainly hope they don't have to worry about. Well, for the love of God, guys, just stay in your dorms, okay? Don't don't go out. Just stay put, because <laughs> you know, let's let, let's not test our depth too much here, okay? Please. Um, all right, we're gonna take a quick break. When we get back, a couple odds and ends we want to talk about here, um, particularly the CFL shutting down. Who does that affect? How many UCF alums does that affect? going forward um and uh we'll have uh, some controversy that eric lopez happened to stir up this week with his top 10 ucf coaches of all time stick around we'll be right back it's the black and gold banneret podcast welcome back to the black and gold banneret podcast jeff sharon eric lopez and brian murphy with you here let's wrap up the show we got a few odds and ends we want to talk about real quick uh murph dylan moore placed on the injured list with a sprained wrist um, so, someone play tabs. Some yeah. Uh, is have we? Should I? Should I just rip up the ticket with my Dylan Moore for American League MVP bet or what? It's not going to help, Jeffrey. It's not going to help. Oh um, man. I think the I think the, the good news here is that uh, 
is that Dylan is expected to come back sometime early next week. They don't think he'll miss more than the minimum 10 days for his sore wrist. And again, it's too bad. As, as we've documented on this podcast, Dylan Moore is having a great season, slashing 282, 364, 538 with five homers and six steals. Uh, really, if you're in God. fantasy baseball, you really like Dylan Moore as well. So, really, UCF is left with Drew Butera, Bo Taylor, and Dan Winkler in the major leagues right now. But, guys, Bo Taylor now no longer on Cleveland's active roster because their backup catcher, Sandy Leone, was activated off the DL. And in a corresponding move yesterday, the Indians activated by Clevenger uh, and sent down Bo Taylor, which – uh, for those who, I, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's just, I know people may not understand Cleveland Indians baseball, but uh, it is it is uh, funny to me that the, the Indians had to decide between one of the best pitchers in the American League and Bo Taylor, and unfortunately they took one of the best pitchers in the American League. But not before uh, Bo got on the board, right? Right, though, Murph? He did. He got a hit last Thursday. So, uh, so Bo Taylor, this season now, after getting a hit last week, uh, was one for 21. He had a uh, OPS of 178 and an OPS plus of uh, I, I believe it was in the I think, I think it was like negative 49. Like it was <laughs> look, he wasn't there for his offense. He was there for his defense, but now he's not there. He's back at the alternate site. So now with no more hurt and Bo Taylor being shipped back off to the alternate site, UCF has Dan Winkler and Bo and Drew Butera. Uh, Drew Butera uh, got a hit. I mean, I, we're we're really we're really just like. <laughs> Wow, not, we're stringing this one out. We really are. He, he got a hit. Uh, he got a hit yesterday. Still not playing well offensively. But those are those are the really only two active major leaguers that UCF has right now. He's oh. it, Bo is not there to hit. <laughs> let's just now, let's just be we, real we about know, that. Do we know how long more will be out, Murph? That's number one. And I'm actually I can't believe I'm going to ask this question, but it me and our buddy Sam Unger were talking, and Sam Unger, like you guys, are Yankee fans. Do you think the Mariners trade Dylan Moore, that he has high value right now, and could the Yankees be a player for Dylan Moore if that's the case because of all the injuries they've had? Oh, Lordy. I, I don't think so. I know the Yankees have been racked by injuries all over the place, but certainly uh, they have they have depth both internally uh, and guys coming back that they, they probably won't need Dylan Moore. Uh, but certainly if you're, the, if you're Seattle and looking to, to – to, uh, I don't know Dylan Moore's contract per se, but – if you want to, you know, try to sell high and say like he's not going to be this good and try to make something of it, yeah, I could see that. Uh, I'm guys, I I don't know if this is going to happen either, but at some point as we get into September, you're going to see other guys added to the 60-man player pool, and I, I'm keeping my eye for as bad as Boston's pitching has pitching has been, because the Red Sox are on pace, I believe, in some respects, to be the worst pitching staff in the history of baseball. I want to see the Red Sox. I want to see the Red Sox call up Thad Ward. Why haven't? Um, they? Okay. Why haven't they? Why haven't they? And all, he's been good, hasn't he, in the minors? Or am I wrong on that? Look, I, I think if, if you don't have, if you if you really, there's two things. One, he may just may not be ready. Although Thad has been good, certainly has been good. He's one of the Red Red Sox top ten prospects. Uh, but he just may not be ready for this level. And and secondly, if he's not ready, then you don't want to kill his confidence. So you just kind of you know you know keep him around. Hopefully, he is obviously got to be working out somewhere. That is the the one thing I'm fascinated to find out once this is all done is what has happened to those hundreds and hundreds of major le- of minor leaguers who weren't on the 60 man player pools. What did they do all summer? Uh, guys like Jeff Hakinson and guys right. like what's their story like? So, but with with Thad because he has proved himself at some levels of the minor leagues uh, and because Boston's pitching is literally no better than me going out there at this moment. I, 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 I'm just waiting for them to at least add him to the mix, but I don't think that's going to happen. Give yourself a little bit of credit there. All right, well, well, we'll keep... Real, 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 real quick, because somebody asked me this, and I think I know your answer, but I need to ask it. The Rays have been hurt with a lot of injuries with their pitching uh, staffs. I think they have nine guys now in the injured sure. list. Is that right? Pitching nine list? guys. Nine guys. Any chance... Hakinson, just because they're they're desperate, they're they're just short. They get called up at some point here. I know he's not on the sixty man roster, but at some point, if, what happens if you run out of arms? Yeah, I mean, I think that would something something really catastrophic will have had to happen to the Rays pitching staff. I think for for Jeff to get at it, only because 
what has he done? What, what has he been? Doing? We don't even like, like certainly they've kept their like their scouts have, like not even their like their their their. I, I assume they they kept eyes on him, but like what is he doing? Like where is he? Uh, where are any of these guys? So I think the fact that he hasn't really been facing, uh, you know, real other pro hitters on a consistent basis at a training site probably means no, he's not going to come up, and I don't think it's a serious discussion. All right, guys, if you guys know Jeff Hakins and his whereabouts, so, you please yes. let Brian Murphy someone know. send a, Someone send out an APB for Jeff Hakins. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, if you're out there, DM us at UCF underscore banner at. We need to know where you are. <laughs> it's, something, it's something I'll definitely do, you know, once the season is ended, because uh, I just want to know, like, what was the, what were these, like, four months like for these guys who weren't a part of the player pools? And obviously it's not just UCF, it's everyone. Uh, and some of these guys, like it's, I know there have been some stories written where it's just like, yeah, I'm just trying to stay in shape, going to the gym, you know, trying to stay loose at the house. Like, man, he, I mean, it's it's just it's it's it's. But again, it's like we've said all show, it's just not a normal year. All right, well, the the not normal year stories continue with uh, something that affects some uh, UCF alumni as well on the football side. The CFL announced that it was uh, shutting down operations for this year. Um, they were trying to get a government loan from the Canadian government um, to try and keep operations going for this year. They, uh, the Canadian government uh, said, no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. How about you go get a private loan just like everybody else? And so instead of actually doing that, the CFL owners, who are obviously terrible people, decided to can the entire season anyway. But... Um, the CFL has been a key destination for a number of UCF players who who have been either looking to get to the National Football League and have had some opportunities or a place where they could have a job if they didn't make the NFL. Uh, I know that, you know, for in our case, in, in those these cases, Eric Lopez, you know, guys like Terrence Plummer, uh, Joe Burnett have been stars in the CFL coming out of UCF. Keith Shalligan, I think, has also played for uh, a, a number of years in, in the league right now. Uh, looking at the CFL's um, uh, total player roster, only one former UCF Knight is actually on a, a CFL roster right now, and that's TJ Mutcherson. But um, what are the concerns, though, Eric, about the possibility that um, you know, it, maybe some, th- that this could be uh, a, a real bad situation for the CFL in general, and then these kinds of opportunities for UCF players um, could dry up? Well, I agree. I mean, I wa- I'm partly a part of me is wondering if the CFL will return, and if it does, you know, in what you know, in what form does it return? Uh, maybe it's reduction on teams. Who knows? Uh, it's pretty way. It's pretty wild the difference in the two countries, right? Like the states were trying to figure out ways to play football and everything. In Canada, they're like, yeah, don't, no, don't even that, don't even ask us to help. There are only there are only nine <laughs> teams in the CFL, and they're they're going to get. Yeah. They're planning on having a tenth one in 2021. But uh, but again, yeah, right. There, there's only there's only nine teams right now. So well, right, it's going to be. I don't know. We'll see what happens with that. And then you know, it, then the question also becomes: Do you believe that the XFL? I can't believe I'm saying this. Could they return at some point? Owned by Dwayne owned by the Jackson, Rock. The yep. Rock, right? Uh huh. Who did play football as an actor? Do you believe in that theory that he could return? And if so. You know, does the when would that be for the XFL? I mean, there's some theories. Maybe it's next spring, next you know, whenever. Who knows? I it's, I just I think what's going to happen is there's always going to be efforts to be made to find to make more football be played. Uh, but no, I mean it is a concern, if, uh, at least from the CFL standpoint. Like everybody else, you wonder as we deal with the pandemic that we're all dealing with the globally, what what uh, who retukes who's able to survive, who doesn't survive, and what does things look like even if you do return. So I think those are valid questions. It's something that we should understand here when it comes to, you know, people scoff at the CFLO, Canadian football. You know, the Grey Cup it, it has been, it, they've been playing for the Grey Cup for longer than the NFL has been in existence. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. I mean, I, it, I, it, I, and, I, and it's, there. it's a very proud tradition up north. And, and, you know, like we said, there are a lot of players and, and coaches actually too, who have gotten opportunities there that they wouldn't have gotten anywhere else to play. Yeah, I mean, you would think they would be back next year, so I think the opportunities will still be there, but you never know. Who knows? It depends what the economics are like, and uh, you know, I think those are the two things you're looking at, and I think it's a good point you bring up, because we talked earlier on the show about 
the extra year of eligibility. But I think you and I and Murph, I think you agree as well with football. I think you're still going to see guys leave early. Uh, I don't think the extra year is really going to really be that big of a drastic impact on football play rosters. I know people are freaking out about, oh, we could have 120 players on the right. No, I don't think it will because I still believe, especially this year, I think you'll see juniors and seniors depart early. Uh, and I think if there's more opportunities to play football, I think you'll even have more guys encouraged to leave early because get out while you can. And I, so I, I think you're, you know, that's a valid point to follow here in the coming months. I'm curious to see what, what, why did, why do you, why do we think the rock purchased the XFL? Do you, I mean, do you think it was just for, Hey, I have the XFL or does he have something in mind? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I am kind of, I, I, I'm curious. I think he purchased it because it was really cheap. Holy moly! Right, but I mean, do you think do you think he'll do something, or do you think he's gonna just put the XFL logo on his shelf? I mean, wait, like that's the question. Like, yeah, maybe it's just a power play, or you know, like a you know, just want to have that for cachet. But like, I mean, I mean, literally, the man bought a, a sports, a professional sports league for twenty five million dollars, and that is just. It's peanuts. Uh, it, well, well, hold up, hold up, hold up. $25 million is not peanuts to anybody outright, okay? Um, it's professional it's, sports league. Uh, uh, well, for a professional sports league, yes, but not for The Rock, <laughs> not for Dwayne Johnson. And I know how much money he has in the bank, but but $25 million is still um, – or excuse me, $15 million. $15 million was what he bought it for. I'm he's, sorry. I always- he's, that's all right. That's all right. But still, $15 million is still a lot of money. And no person, no person with half a brain in business is going to buy an investment like that for that much money and then do nothing with it. Um, now, whether he tries to actually revive it, uh, I, I know one thing as a fan I would like to see him try because obviously we know, like you said, Eric, you know, Dwayne Johnson's roots are in football. Played played football for right. the University of Miami. You know, during during the uh, the heyday of the U in the late '80s and early '90s. Um, I think he would be. I think he would be a very interesting person to have at the helm of a league because he's, like I said, he's a football guy. Vince McMahon never was. Um, they'll have to sort out the whole thing with Oliver Luck, who I thought was doing a very, very good job with the with the league um, prior to the whole thing. The whole thing kind of getting getting coveted, if we can say that. Um, well, but here's the other thing too, though. I mean, this is what's fascinating. If, and Murph, correct me if I'm wrong. The Rock obviously has the TV show on uh, series on HBO, Ballers. I think right. he has a he has, doesn't he have a producing role in that as well? If I'm not mistaken, uh, at, this as, that, at this point that wouldn't surprise me. So I wonder, could the XFL be more of a hey, this could be either for Ballers or maybe a you know a project that he's working with and movie. You know, he would own the rights to it to use it in a movie. Could be that could be the play too. So who knows? That's why I'm really interested to see what he's doing. Or or this could be like a huge swerve, and it turns out he gives it to Vince McMahon at WrestleMania next year in a part of a, a career threatening match against Triple H. Maybe it's that too. <laughs> who knows? He he is he is an executive producer of Ballers yeah. along with no, that's along with right. Danny Garcia and Mark Wahlberg. So there you go. That see so who knows? This could be used for movies, or it could be used to start up the league again. I don't know, but I, I I think Dwayne has proven you know to be a pretty smart business guy. So there he's going to use it for something. What it is, right. who knows? I just right. want to mention, like I, again, I know this is all relative. Certainly, fifteen million dollars is a lot of money, but again, but again, he made more money just <laughs> take just getting the role for the last Fast and Furious film. He made more money than it cost him to buy a professional football league. He is made any the 20- height. How many he made twenty million dollars just to just to be cast in that film. It's not including like back end receipts that he's probably definitely going to get as well. He, I mean, his net worth is like, I, I, God. I mean, it's just a it's just a good buy. I, I, like, I, good, I agree with I agree with Murph on that, Jeff. I mean, fifteen I million is chump change. The rock. I'm days, guessing if he if he's if he's not gonna if he's not gonna actually restart the league somehow, um, maybe he's purchasing it for the intellectual property of it. Uh, oh, that is something. Okay, so so maybe, and I'm not just talking about the team brands. I'm talking about like you know perhaps the video. For example, you could. We've seen actually, if you guys are are astute at, at seeing these kinds of things, you know, a lot of old footage and photos from the USFL 
is used in um, in commercials, in promotional advertisements where they can't get, and obviously they can't use you know the NFL in college. So, but there you know there's a there's whatever company owns the rights to see it to the U, the old USFL, they license that out even today as uh, you know for promotional video purposes, almost like you know like iStock Photo, right? But I would wonder I wonder if maybe that could be an angle. I don't know. But what I know is that I wish that there were more opportunities for former UCF players to be seen on the gridiron and you know and and not and not having those opportunities is it you know as a UCF fan is a bad thing, I think. And I hope that he does restart and I hope the CFL recovers eventually one day. All right, last thing we got to do before we go. Um make sure you check out blackandgoldbanneret.com because Eric has stirred a hornet's nest uh, by yeah, ranking the top. The, he, we've got the top ten head coaches in UCF history, um, and you know, Eric, this is the conclusion of you know we did the male athletes, we did the female athletes. You know, now we're doing coaches. We're going to do assistant coaches, which I think is going to be fun. But this boy, did you stir some controversy? Huh? Let's uh, let's recap the top ten, uh, shall we? Um, I got to pull it up here, but to actually see it, but. Uh, Man, there was some uh, well, some no discussion surprise. on social I mean, right? media about I remember, this. I remember, I remember you and I when we started brainstorming this back in March about some of these topics. We, I mean, I admit, you give you credit. I'll give you credit. You said for at first, nah, I don't think we should do it. That's going to be really controversial. And then you know we said, nah, we'll just do it anyway. No, yeah, yeah, but you were right though. It was. I mean, people yeah. are. It, it's very fascinating how people have such drastic opinions. On some of these coaches, the same coach. Very polarizing. Very yes. polarizing. Um, and I would admit this was a harder list than the players doing the athletes, both male and female, even the assistant coaches. This was a lot harder. I actually consulted to the, our staff. I want to thank Andrew for helping, you know, helping out with his opinions. You guys threw in your opinions, and we even had big arguments on that in our little discussions, as we will. There was a lot of drastic differences. Uh, even on that. So this was a very complicated list. I mean, you could, ar- I would argue that from one to 18, there's not a big difference. Uh, that's how close I think this was in some cases, but it is interesting how passionately some people have either or I've heard arguments for certain coaches on both sides of the table, like, Oh, they're too low. And then the other ones are too high. Um, which was very fascinating. So I don't know wh- which angle you want to start with. Cause there's been well, multiple angles. Let's start with about on this list, but go ahead. Well, let's let's start from ten up to one. Gene McDowell is at ten. Jay Bergman at nine. Um, George O'Leary at eight. Plenty of controversy to be had in those first three, right? Uh, yeah. Tied tied for seventh, we have Kirk Sparrow and Renee Lures Gillespie. Uh, Can I defend Kirk for a second? Because I, I I've gotten some back back things about Kirk. Why is Kirk ahead of George? Go ahead. Why is Kirk ahead of of Gene? And I don't I think I think we really do not appreciate at all what Kirk did. I think we look at Kirk and you look at his record and you're like, oh, he's just this average coach and this or that. If you study this UCF basketball and look what Kirk inherited prior to his arrival, the last 10 seasons, UCF basketball had one winning season. They had a 15 win season. They they their second best season during that time period was 10 wins this season you could make the argument they were the worst college basketball program during that time frame they won 96 games he inherited an absolute I, i'm not even dumpster I mean, I fire let's call it I, that. That, that yeah i mean i think for people i don't think they understand like he sir he brought this program to life out of the dead yeah um and and and, and re- with no no facilities like Look, you and I, Jeff and Murph, I think you might have gone to – maybe it was – but no, you were after. But you, we went to the old UCF arena, which is now the venue, and and no, and we broadcasted as students there. And I enjoyed going to those games at that arena. But let's be real. That is an absolute embarrassment to have as a basketball one, Division One program home. I mean, it's a joke. Nobody would uh, – no good players would nobody go went. There. Nobody went to the games. Right. We, we were happy uh, if, they, if they had 1,500 people at a, in a 5,100-seat arena. Correct. He had he literally built got this program respectable with one hand tied behind his back, I would argue. And and I would argue too that his O four and his O five team 
if today's day and age would have been properly seeded. You could argue that those teams, especially that 05 team, Jeff, that you covered closely, that played Connecticut and Worcester, and then played uh, Pittsburgh the year before in there. They should have been higher seeded. I think they were a 15 seed in 05, and they were like a 13 in 04. You could make an argument they should have been an 11 or a 12 seed, and they just weren't. And you could argue it's because of, you know, back then they just looked at the brands or whatever. But no, they, they, just, they, they said, oh, who won the A Sun? All right, we'll put that team down, for, right. you know, oh, as, you down as far as so, possible. That's what it was. I, I just I, – I'm, I, I'm really I, – I think people really should appreciate him more than they are. I, I, and he was a good representative. I remember he would always come and shake your hand. He was always a fan. And he, and he really had a connection with the fan base. Like every time he would come out, there would be that Kirk, 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 you know, chance. There was a Kirk's jerks section. Yeah. Uh, there was shout a great shout out to Biggie, Anthony Bencomo. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think the guy should deserve a lot more credit. I know some people have come back and said, well – why you're you're pointing out O'Leary's uh, you know issues and and Bergman's issues and McDowell, but you didn't bring up Sparrow and and the violations. And my argument counter to that is yes, there was violations at the end under his watch, but the athletic director was involved in that. So uh, right. Keith Tribble was that. If you look at the search there and all that, like, and that's why I've always defended Donnie. Some people have been critical about Donnie and those violations. Keith Tribble was involved in a lot of that stuff. So. Uh, I think Kirk should get a lot more credit. He should be in the Hall of Fame down the road. And I hope – I just I, – I, I know if you look at it, if you look at it with, you know, as quickly, oh, what's so impressive. But I think what he did was more impressive than any – with all due respect to Gene McDowell and George O'Leary and even Jay Bergman. What Kirk Sparrow did I think was way more difficult and more impressive. I'm sorry. I do. Yeah. Um. I, I I have nothing to add to that. I think you're 100 percent right, and you know I'm and, a little biased say- toward Kirk because you know I, I will say I'm one of the many people who, along the lines of their career and then their time as a student, um, he helped out in terms of in in terms of development. Not just you know uh, it, 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 he gave us access to students that we never would have gotten at any at any school that helped us to become you know better better reporters, announcers, journalists, you name it, and. I'm very appreciative of him, so I'm, you know, obviously I'm biased towards him. And I'll make this other one because the other one I got back. Well, some people thought Bergman should be ahead of Renee Gillespie, and obviously, obviously, I got the well, you're doing it because you're the softball, you're a bias there. Here's my, here's the stat I'll give you about Renee versus Jay because I think they actually have similar resumes. But you know what Renee did that that no other UCF coach has ever done, and will never do. Uh, she, I, I know exactly what she did because uh, it's one of my favorite stats ever. She won, she won conference championships in three different leagues. Correct, uh, the A Sun Conference USA and the American, and left UCF in good shape with the program. Unlike Jay, and I like Jay, so I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm piling on. Uh, but Berth, I want to bring you in on this because you started covering UCF baseball at the end of the Bergman era. This was when you were a student. And unfortunately, right. that ended really bad. Uh, forget the off-the-field stuff, which I wrote about. Just on the field, they were a big disappointment in Conference USA. And, and really, the program, uh, unfortunately, went south at the end there. And he did not adjust to Conference USA like Coach Gillespie did with softball. No, they had a really tough time once they made the move uh, to Conference USA. And like you said, Eric, uh, it ended in you know disgrace to some level. And you have to add that in, as I, I think you certainly did, with these coaches who, if you have a, a, a you know if you have a blotch on your record uh, for off the field transgressions or or something like that, something of, of, to that extent, you have to calculate calculate that into the ranking. And I think that is something that uh, if if you know does ding Jay Bergman here because. He left. He was fired, uh, you know, uh, you know, or let go very abruptly due to what happened, uh, you know, at the end of his tenure. But really, his time, had, had, I think, had come because of the struggles they had, and they knew it was time for a new voice. And then well, that didn't really work out great either. But that's a different story. Yeah. Um, moving on with the top ten, Amanda Cromwell checks in at six. Uh, Long time. Uh, head coach for UCF women's soccer, who's now at UCLA, and then here's where it gets interesting. At least, at least, <laughs> at least where the conversation got interesting on Twitter. Um, Scott Frost, number five. Um, two two years, second year undefeated, won the yeah. won a won a share of a national championship, and I think that, I mean, my argument for Frost is he saved the program because this program was in 
dire straits. And, and, and of course, we can say, hey, give credit to Danny White for hiring him. Of course. You know, but a lot of this has to be has to do with being the right guy at the right time. And Scott Frost in in what twenty uh, four months, maybe even you could, you turned UCF from the worst team in Division One FBS into one of the best, and not only that, but changed the entire culture around mm-hmm. UCF football from stem to stern and. You know what, and everything that you see with, with what put UCF up on, you know where they are right now. Scott Frost had to do with that, so yeah. I, I I see I see the floor. <laughs> Arguably the greatest turnaround in the history of college football. Yes, he won a national championship. He did it in two years. I get it, but like you said, Jeffrey, his impact on this program extends so far out, both in years and in breadth, in terms of the impact that he had of the program's viability nationally as a brand. Again, you know, the AAC really, really thanks UCF for its success because without it, the AAC is is not anywhere close to being the power six conversation that it wants to be without UCF's success in football, and that's because of Scott Frost. And then you look at just the players and, and the legacies that he introduced to this program and how it's impacted it. Without, without Scott Frost, you don't have Mackenzie Milton. You don't have Adrian Killens. You don't have Jakeem Griffin playing a prominent role. Certainly, you don't, you don't know that. I mean, certainly he might have been the next coach. but He you was a know. non-factor pro- with the previous staff. I mean, Absolutely. So maybe, maybe another coach would have come in and said, hey, this guy's pretty good. We'll give him time. But all we know is that Scott Frost actually did that. You also don't have Dylan Gabriel. You are not running a 21st century offense if you don't bring in Scott Frost, you, you don't and have the will... space jerseys, right? I mean, no. the, I mean the jerseys. I mean, and also the branding, the marketing, right. all of that. Yeah. And people can say you got to give credit to George O'Leary for building up the program for its winless season. Yeah, but then he lost it again because they were winless when he left. So, it, so it sort of equals. It sort of you know it cancels itself out. And then of course there's the other stuff that I won't get into, which is really cringy. Uh, and so <laughs> Frost. Is by far the most impactful football coach this program has ever had. If they want to build a statue of a football coach, they should build it to him or have his name somewhere on that stadium, uh, anywhere, like on the field. I don't care. He he turned UCF from an absolute irrelevancy to you know perennial powerhouse in the span of 24 months. And, I, and it's just it's it's really remarkable, obviously. No, you, really know, you know, it's it, you know, it's actually one of the most remarkable statistics about that whole thing is that Scott Frost in his entire head coaching career has had one winning season and it was the undefeated season at UCF. It's the greatest <laughs> season ever, though. The program history. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, um, and, and I just want to, you know, obviously that that's all valid. I will point out because obviously a lot of people said, "What about you know the O'Leary McDowell?" We have to include him on this because mm-hmm. McDowell did a lot of good things too. But McDowell also and has a felony charge in, you know over the cell phone issue that ended pretty ugly. <laughs> and I think ironically he's not. And that's because he's not. That's why he's not in the UCF Athletics Hall of Fame as of now because right. of that. Um, it, but and they've been. And by the way, they've been trying to get that changed. I know, and they can't do it. Right, but I, you know, in studying Gene. Uh, who did a lot for the program, and George did a lot for the program. But you could argue they're both similar in this regard. They won a lot, and yet you left yourself asking, why didn't we need more, right? Because they had talent. Like, you go by those, some of those Gene teams with John Becton and Sean Jefferson, who was like an afterthought on one of those teams, the semifinal team who ended up having a great NFL career. You're wondering, like, why did we not win the whole national title with that kind of roster they had? Because Gene was more of a conservative, run the football, uh, instead of throwing airing it out as much. Um, you know, and I think with George, there are things you could pick from a, a from a head coaching standpoint. He started Pete DeNovo over Justin Holman, which some would argue cost him the Penn State game up in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, right. Uh, you know, you have the quarterback situation in 09 and 010 but with going with Calabrese. Rob Calabrese over Brett Hodges going with over Jeff Gottfried in 2010. Uh, under 500 in 2011. Yeah. They're, I'm going to throw up. I'm going to throw yeah. up. 
so bad. Hey, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and you know, obviously 2015, we know how that ended, but Scott Frost picked Mackenzie Milton, and that was not a no-brainer. Jeff, you and I were at the Cure Bowl when Mackenzie was booed, and there was a yeah. lot of cynics. Remember, everybody's like, why is Frost so, like, why is he determined to play this kid? Why does he think he's that going to be that good? And Frost kept telling people he's going to win a lot of games for him, and he was correct. Uh, and even that six and seven year, which I kind of feel now people take it. It's funny. People are like, oh, that was a losing season. I didn't think they would win six games that year going. Now, I, 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 I could argue you could argue they overachieved that year. Considering he was implementing his system with a bunch of guys that really had no didn't fit, but he found the way and he got he brought belief. Those players had no interest in playing football and he got them to play football and, you know, and he developed McKenzie Milton. He won six games, got him to a bowl game, and brought some positivity. And I and I think he's just a better coach. I really do think he's a better coach than Gene and George. And that's not a knock on them. That's a compliment on him. And I don't if if you're a, and I think a lot of you people in this audience, we embrace if you if you embrace that national championship season, you have to embrace the coach that gave you that national title. Every school does that. You don't just say, well, he won the national title, but screw him. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. So, you know, and I think you both have done a good job explaining his contributions. And I hope at some point people get over the fact he wore, you know, Nebraska colors on a championship Saturday. He can wear whatever colors you want as long as you win games. I could care less. Yeah. No. Well, um, <laughs> can you defend Lucy McDaniel real quick, Jeff? Yeah, I, I, I do. Well, we I've have gotten criticism about her being ranked number two. We Some haven't gotten to Duke should be ahead in others. We yeah. haven't gotten to Lucy yet because we, we can't forget about Jim Rudy at number four, who, by the way, yeah. coached both men's and women's soccer to national prominence. Okay, which is why yes, which is why I ranked them ahead of Cromwell because some argue, some asked me why isn't Amanda ahead of them because Amanda has great success and you could argue she's the better women's soccer head coach from a whole body of work, but you just mentioned the impact that Jim had. Which yeah, is and by the way, you could argue also Amanda Cromwell doesn't even hear about UCF were it not for Jim Rudy getting Correct. Michelle Lakers right. and then and then Michelle like like Michelle talked about it about in the podcast that she had with us. Uh, a few weeks back, you know, she she uh, was instrumental in Amanda Cromwell coming to UCF and and following in their footsteps. So, number three, uh, Linda Gooch, two na- or three national championships, um, and UCF is a national power in the in, in the in yeah. in the sport of in the sport of spirit. And I was disappointed that some people didn't catch on when I said three is a magic number. She's won three national titles, and yet I had people say she's too low, which is good. I guess it it shows <laughs> that she's gotten respect. But Murph, they don't like my. I, I appreciate the argument there. that I appreciate the argument that she's at number three, and people are saying she's too low. I appreciate that argument. I don't agree with it, but I appreciate it. And I'll tell mm-hmm. you, I'll tell you why I don't, I don't necessarily agree with this because we, I think we got two and one correct. Number two is Lucy McDaniel, who never in my mind got enough credit um, it, 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 for the. I mean, she was a true trailblazer in women's sports at a time um, when the NCAA did not carry women's sports. You know, the, 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 women's sports were relegated to. Uh, an organization called the AIAW, all right? Uh, and that's where she won a national championship for UCF. And she is the answer to the trivia question, who is the only head coach of a UCF team sport who coached her team to a uh, to a tournament national championship that's uh, that's recognized by the NC- that's recognized in NCAA history and that would be Lucy McDaniel. All right? And uh, 55 and 0 National championship season in uh, in volleyball, a two thirty six and thirty four record in volleyball, which is amazing. By the way, the the bookends to that nineteen seventy eight uh, undefeated fifty five and O team. Nineteen seventy seven, they went fifty six and six. Nineteen seventy nine, they went fifty four and five. <laughs> I mean, so so. And if you ask anyone who, by the way, the people who you really need to talk to about this is not just the folks around the volleyball community in in Central Florida, but speak to the people who uh, who Lucy uh, was associated with at her alma mater, Florida State, because they named the court after her there, 
and she was absolutely instrumental in the development of women's sports in the state of Florida. Um, she truly is a giant in terms of the in terms of being a pioneer. There's no question about that. Um, she made history, not just on the floor, but off. And her contributions, um, I think, should rightfully be recognized um, here as the as the number two uh, greatest head coach of all time at uh, of any sport at UCF. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you could make an argument she should be number she could be number one. Uh, the only reason yeah. I didn't is she's not number one is because the person I did put number one, Torchy Clark, is not only in the UCF Hall of Fame. I mean, he's in about every Hall of Fame you could think about. He's in the UCF Hall of Fame, but he's in the Florida Sports Hall of Fame. Only one of three UCF people to be in the Florida Sports Hall of Fame alongside Michelle Akers and Winston DeBose. Which, uh, so, uh, and you look at Torchy and his run. He never had a losing season. He built a dynasty. He was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Mm -hmm. Sports Illustrated, um, which is pretty remarkable. And then when he retired, you could the basketball program crumbled, uh, yeah. which tells you how important he was. And it and I think people Torchy's just still he still has this magical illusion there. He taught a class at UCF, which I kind of find him I enjoy. Right, like isn't there something cool about that to have a guy you know. One of your coaches coaching one of your classes in, in school at UCF, and you know he's honored there. So that's the reason why I put Torchy because I feel in a lot of ways he's the perfect representation right now uh, for UCF as far as coaching head coaches are concerned all time, just because of what he did on the court and even the impact he's made off the court. And we had Bo Clark talk about it in depth with his book about uh, about yeah. Torchy. Yeah, uh, to me Torchy is the pop Warner of UCF sports, right? It just all of the branches go back to him and how supportive he was of everybody else on uh, in, in the other programs around him. Mean, he he was totally he, he totally punched higher than his weight class. Um, and, and, you know, people are going to say, well, this was, you know, back in the day when UCF was what? You know, you know, it, it, uh, barely an NCAA team. But it, it, this was a very competitive team when he was there. I think, you know, we, we heard Bo talk about it. About how, you know, UCF were they in Division One? They would have competed because it was just a different. Um, it, it, it was a much different time. Whether some of the better teams in Division Two, which UCF was in at the time, would have easily been able to compete with Division One had they had they had the opportunity to. It's just it, it was just the technicalities of classification that kept them from doing so. Um, everything that you see at UCF, I think, in, in a number of different sports, goes back to Torty Clark in some way. How supportive he was of um, the other coaches and the other programs as UCF was developing as a program. Um, his success on the uh, you know on the floor is uh, it speaks for itself. And uh, and he, like I said, he's the originator. He, um, it like yeah, uh, the Pop Warner. I think of UCF overall two seventy four and eighty nine. Uh, for his uh, basketball record, 20 or more wins in seven seasons. Um, and bled black and gold, came back to UCF, taught classes. Got him to the Final Four. Got him to the Final Four, yeah. Hall of Famer, he's done it all. Uh, so that's the list. Let me ask you both this, because somebody asked me this. Because obviously, if you go through the entire top 40 list, we're pretty fortunate. I think we're in a good era right now, head coaching-wise, top to bottom. 11 to 20 in particular, 11 to 25 range, we pretty much almost have all the active head coaches right. on those rankings, except, except for Coach Ball Malone and Dana Boone, and that's because they literally just got here, like five, you know, two years ago, less than two years they ago. Might, they so, might be, <laughs> if, if the tr current trajectory holds, they might be fairly agreed. soon. Fairly soon. Agreed. Agreed. Here's a question, somebody, an interesting question. Of all of the active head coaches right now, if you would pick one that you think could crack the top 10 or the top five, by the time their career is done, who would you pick? Ooh, that's a uh, good question. Murph, you go so, first. Yeah, I guess you want to think about it too. Um, All right, I got one. I got one if you want me to go first. Obviously, obviously, my knowledge base is is in the major sports, uh, but I, I have to think that Johnny Dawkins has a good opportunity because he's still relatively, relatively young for a college basketball coach, and he is showing now certainly – that he can basically turn water into wine. He can spin, you know. He can he can spin, you know, uh, 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 just rope into into gold with what he has done with some rosters. And, and I think building a building on that 
possibly getting back obviously to another few uh, another few tournaments. Uh, obviously, needs to win a conference turn a conference title would help certainly. But well, well, think- Murph, well, Murph, let me ask you my our favorite question. I like to ask Jeff hates this question, but you know where I'm going with this question. I don't. I can't wait. If the Aubrey Tippin goes in, where is no. Dawkins ranked? Where is he ranked? And it's, How it's, high do I do I rank him higher than seventeen? Uh, yeah, probably, but not like you know top ten. Probably no, like no, no. fifteen, fourteen. Yeah. But certainly, like I, I think I think Dawkins has the time and the talent and the ability to recruit uh, to get into that into that stratosphere. You took my selection, Murph. I was gonna go. Oh, I was gonna go. Wow. I was gonna go with Dawkins. I all right, all right. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go in two different directions here. All right. I'm gonna say, if we're talking about longevity, I would say probably Todd Dagenet. All right. I could see him up in the top ten easily. Especially, I mean, think about it. if he can get. We talked about this. If he can get him to the Sweet 16 and further here with Met in, yeah. in the next few years, that's going to jump or, you up. Or even dom- you know, dominate the American in sure. in a sure. way that uh, that that we've seen um, that this team has certainly done at least now. Um, two straight championships, and maybe you know who knows if they win a third one this year. Um, and and I'll, I'll throw a wild card in there. You ready for this one? I'm going to go with, uh, because she's ranked 11th, I'm going to go with Becky Kramer. Yeah. I agree with this. I'm going, to go, I'm going to go with Becky Kramer because um, if UCF can really make a, it can continue their dominance in the American in rowing and then, who knows, make a run in the NCAAs if she gets, you know, if, if, if they're able to get, you know, into the top 10, who knows, maybe one of the boats wins a national title. She moves up. There's no question about yeah. that, and uh, I, I, that's that's what I would like to see. And by the way, speaking of national title chances, another one who I think we should watch out for, Scott Calabrese. Yes, yes, that's why I ranked them 16, and the reason I ranked them 16 is they got to the Sweet 16 round last year, first time in program history. Uh, I agree with you. I think he's a guy that could move up uh, for sure. I, I think so I, I think that there's a good shot UCF could win a national championship if that trajectory keeps on going. Because, you know, yeah. obviously men's soccer is a smaller sport in terms of teams that you're competing with. Um, the talent level is high at UCF. Um, the offense that they run is just spectacular. Um, and the and the tournament is smaller, right? So if they can, you know, host a couple times, you know, get into the top 10 in the RPI, Beat some teams out of conference in a good year. Look out. So, a lot of good Pretty options. There. Really good. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying, don't you think this is like the I – mean, I, I know it sounds very knee-jerk, like in the moment and whatever, whatever but I do think this, co- this whole group of head coaches we have currently on campus, you could argue maybe is the best in the history of the, of the athletic department's history. And we've had some good ones, but I, I from top to bottom, Who's the weak? I mean, who's the weak one? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, good luck. I mean, this is a pretty strong class of yeah. coaches here that we currently got. And I'll go full circle here. I'll throw you a, a, another one, top 10 candidate. If Josh Heupel gets this team to Pasadena, if Brian Murphy's calling in from Pasadena oh boy. or Bourbon Street, top 10, baby, book it, playoffs. Huh? I mean, I mean, I, I mean – is what it, what if the, where's the championship not, game this year supposedly Miami but why well, well, Murph I mean, Murph if it, if like they go to game. Miami if they yeah. go to Miami just mint the bust already right Ooh. oh mint the bust already M- mint uh, the bust already for Josh Heupel wait, like but like but but let's be like isn't Josh Heupel really just sort of playing with Scott Frost's toys Whoa. oh like, boy. Dylan Gabriel's not here if not for Kim McKenzie Milton, and McKenzie Milton's not here if not for Scott Frost. Like the guys, like like Scott Frost has not separated himself to a point where I think like, oh, now I know he's a really good coach. Like he certainly has proven he's a, he's a fine coach, but he is playing with a loaded cupboard uh, 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 of skill players that were brought here by the previous coach. Give Josh Heupel a you know a four year cycle of bringing in his own players and and seeing how that works. 
if he makes it to the championship this year, that's great. I don't think that's a top five right away because uh, – We didn't say top five. We didn't say top five. We said maybe well, top ten. I, again, I, I think that's uh, – uh, Polly, look, if you win a national title in football, I understand that. But <laughs> I, I think the argument has to be made that Josh wow. Heupel for – Most of the guys who were here are not here – because they committed to Josh Heupel. Most of the guys were impacting the play oh, man. on the field. Wow. I hope Josh isn't listening to this, Murph. Oh, <laughs> boy. Not. I mean, geez, <laughs> who, who recruited Greg McRae and, and Marlon Williams and, uh, and, and Trey Nixon and, and – and I mean, come well, on, I, hope, guys. I hope everybody listening was trashing me in the last week about Scott Frost. Go, go, go direct it at Murph now. All right. Can you give me a break? Good <laughs> Lord. Holy all Christ. right. Well, let's right. let's wrap this up. I, I thought I, Eric, once again, well done on this. I, I thought you, you did both. a great thank job. Thank you both and Andrew and our staff I, and for helping me because this was a complicated one. And, and I hope people realize, again, you don't have to agree with the rankings. That's fun. It's all subjective. Uh, but you know, we're acknowledging a lot of different people and a lot of different sports, and I think that's been the whole goal of this, and I, right. I think people have enjoyed it uh, under these unique circumstances. And we got more still to come. Yep, we're going to look at the top 30 assistant coaches in UCF history, and um, you might be thinking, oh my God, you guys are really pulling this out. And first of all, you're going to be really interested to see some of the names that showed up on this list and what they've gone on to do since UCF, and that's why we're doing it to, to finish out the UCF 250. We're going to do that. Uh, starting this weekend as well. Uh, Murph, what else you got coming up this uh, this weekend? We're going to be following football, and I don't know, maybe we'll get that 10th game. I don't know. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I, I, I don't know, Jeff. Like I say every week, I don't know. Uh, I, I There's got to be a it's... gift for this, right? <laughs> you know, somebody Something... somebody sitting there tapping their fingers waiting for it to happen. Something will something will happen, uh, which is why it's worth mentioning. We recorded this late Thursday night. I know. With our luck, so it's going to come happens, out. It's like, going to come out Friday it, at noon, and it probably will. And then somebody will say, "Why did you guys not bring up that news item? They added the schedule. We were not. We we were recording this Thursday night. It didn't show you happen yet. Oh, I, I, I can correct one thing really quickly because I I might have stumbled over my own argument uh, that that uh, you know I said that that who recruited Trey Nixon. Trey Nixon actually came here during the 2018 offseason, so technically you could say they oh. – But, again, uh, Richie Grant, Antoine Collier, Brandon Moore. Uh, I mean, uh, there's so many guys who are in- integral to this team. It's all because of Scott Frost. It's not because of Heupel. He has made them fu- – like, he's kept them being good players, but they're here because they were brought here by Frost. I'm just, I just wanted to – Yeah. That. There you go. Uh, this concludes uh, the corrections portion of the program. Just, <laughs> send, send your additional uh, corrections to blackandgoldbanneret at gmail.com. Look, people, people will correct me. I mean, I'm correcting myself right now. I said 10 minutes ago I couldn't figure out I couldn't figure out the adage turning straw into gold. And so I used the word cord because I couldn't find the word straw in my small brain. And so I'm going to correct that now as well. Anything else? Yeah, Probably. I'm not going to. That's, no, that's that that wasn't worth it. That one wasn't worth. It. I don't think. I think you slipped that one in. No one would. No one would have noticed Murph, one way or the other. Merv, you have content <laughs> on the site too, don't you? Right now. Oh, has he? Does he ever? <laughs> we we talked to um, Josh Eipel on Thursday, uh, and sort of got a camp update. You know about the battles going on, and I run through all the players that you, that that Heupel talked about and sort of talked up. Um, but really. It, it, this was our first time talking to anybody at UCF uh, since you know our country has been uh, you know been been refocused on the talk of, of, of racial inequality and uh, and injustice and we got Josh Heupel's thoughts on that uh, and you know he talks a lot about how he wants to give the players a platform to speak out speak their minds but also keep the conversation going between you know in house with the players and the coaches. Because Heupel says that the things that the players have have brought to the table, the ideas they've exposed exposed to him or espoused to him, ha- have made him a better coach. And I, I think that will continue to happen as we move forward. You've seen certain uh, college football programs today on Thursday not practice in order to make a statement and to, and to raise awareness for for what we're going through right now with the continue the continuation of racial inequality and, and injustice. So. Uh, UCF did not do that today. It may not try me if they end up doing that at some point, 
Um, and I think at least Hypo is open to having those discussions because those discussions need to be had. And I, I would just implore everyone, if I could just like editorialize for like a quick second, I would implore them. Because you know, you never do that, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I would I would implore those who who don't like this being brought up and don't don't want to talk about it, think that this shouldn't be involved in sports and don't understand the messaging of why uh, college programs and professional athletes are not playing or not practicing. What is it? What does it accomplish? I understand that this does not end racism. What they're trying to get you to do with, with in, a, in a very very collective effort is to ask why exactly they are doing this why are they you know standing up for this what is it about this that i should know and too many people who don't care to learn and educate themselves too many people just want to fall back upon the the you know having their confirmation bias and getting the, the dopamine rush of falling back into things that that they already think and they need someone to confirm for them and they hate the cognitive dissonance that this creates in them, and so they just fall back on what they already know. I implore people that if you do not understand why men in sports are crying, why Jordan Johnson, who is an absolute beloved former UCF football player, said on Twitter today, all lives don't matter until black lives matter. If you don't understand that, I implore you to look at the history of the black man in America, not just today, but going all the way back through the 20th century, and why those people now are, are trying to shine a light on it because they have the platform to do so. We as fans have given them that platform. Again, if it wasn't for us watching on TV and going to games and buying paraphernalia, the sports would not have as much of an impact as they do. But because of us, they had that platform. We cannot admonish them for the, them using it. And so now they are just trying to get you to notice that for one night or two nights, they will not entertain you. But they want you to have a discussion and realize that this is happening and we need to make change. And although, no, racism does not end tomorrow because a couple of basketball games didn't get played. And, you know, it'll take decades, probably past our own lifetimes. But we all have a part in this and we all can do our own measure to make sure there is change because we don't live in the 1960s anymore and we don't live in the 1860s. There's always going to be progress. And it seems like there's a long way to go and there is but we can still make progress every day and i just hope that people understand that it's it's just not about one issue either it's about so many other issues but for now that's why i just just understand and try to educate yourself on why this is happening um because it's it obviously it means a lot to a huge portion of, of very important people in this country amen i i, I can't man i can't even there's nothing more I could add to that. I just want to end it right there. I mean, that's drop the mic. Show that's it's over. Brian just dropped the mic on that, and I and you're 100 percent right. And you know, and, and we support what the players are doing because you know these are guys that we know, but they you know, and they are. We're in the middle of a really historic moment in the country. I don't think people really understand that um, how how significant and important what we're living through it is right now, and we live in a time where our technology has progressed to the point where, you know, uh, where messages of truth can get out to the most people at, in the fastest amount of time in human history. And, you know, if, if, and, I say, and I say this all the time, thank goodness for cell phones because we are seeing injustices that people that have long been myths been shown to be realities. And that's something that we're that we're that we must confront. The only way to um, the first step in solving a problem is admitting that there is one. And you know, like you said, Murph, I think you said it. I think I think you said it right on the money. Is it going to solve everything one hundred percent tomorrow? No, but not even not even in this decade or the next decade. This right. is the, this is this is the long. This is this, this is the, the long march. Long. The long march and the long arc that will point toward justice. Like Martin Luther King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. But we're going to see, we're finding out exactly how long that's going to be. Are we bending that arc a little bit? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But um, if that helps our fellow Americans 
see more clearly about other things and helps our uh, our other uh, you know other fellow Americans live better lives and have better lives for their children and their children's children that to me is worth it as well so I think that's a good place to uh, leave it Murph Eric thank you so much once again for joining me thanks you thanks to you the fans for listening uh, make sure you follow us at UCF underscore banneret facebook.com slash black and gold banneret uh, and also, of course, you can find us at blackandgoldbanneret.com, where we are, uh, UCF's home on the SB Nation Network. Follow all of the work that we do there. Uh, thanks, as always, to the rest of our staff um, as well. Jeremy Brenner coming out daily with the newsletter. Um, that's been a big hit. I want to thank him for putting that together as well. Um, Danny Medina, thank you. You've been fantastic. Uh, continuing to pump out really interesting stories every week. So uh, again, thanks for that, and uh, thanks to everyone who uh, to who pays attention to us this, on our little pet project here. That uh, is, well, this year actually, guys, I think it's going to be five years actually next month that this site actually started. So I'll have to double check. I'll have to double check my uh, domain registration, but I'm fairly sure. I'm fairly certain that that's. That we are coming up on the fifth anniversary. So, thanks to all of you for watching and listening and commenting. Uh, and be sure to ask us some questions too as football season's coming up. We have love to do ask the banneret for you as well um, in the coming uh, in the coming shows as we approach football season. For Eric Lopez and Brian Murphy, I'm Jeff Sharon. Thanks for listening. This has been the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast.